And here we are for our third in the series on Psalms Managing Our Emotions. Today we're talking uh, about fear, and so we're going to turn to Psalm 55. So if you have your Bible, you can... And I know you do. <laughs> See, that's uh, it's Pastor Bruno's <laughs> training. always Pastor Bruno in my head for the rest of my life, <laughs> anytime anybody says uh, that. So uh, p pick up your Bible, go to Psalm 55, uh, and we're going to talk about uh, being, when well, you're scared senseless, amen? So yes. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to uh, ask Pastor Beth to kind of get us started here. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless our study tonight, that you, as we deal with, we all have emotions as we deal with managing our emotions, would you speak to us tonight from your word and give us insight that we did not have before and help us walk more and more closely with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to read to you from the book of Psalms today. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Um, so whatever you have in front of you, um, and it does say at the at the top for me that it, it is for the choir director and it is a psalm of David and is to be accompanied by stringed instruments. It says, listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my cry for help. Please listen and answer me, for I am overwhelmed by my troubles. My enemies shout at me, making loud and wicked threats. They bring trouble on me and angrily hunt me down. My heart pounds in my chest. The terror of death assaults me. Fear and trembling overwhelm me, and I can't stop shaking. Oh, that I had wings like a dove, that I would fly away and rest. I would fly far away to the quiet of the wilderness. Those are great. These are great lines. These are great lines. And whether it's physical or emotional or a spiritual battle, We've all fought fear, and the good news is that we gain from the Psalms is that we can learn to handle fear rationally and with confidence. And um, fear is a natural reaction to some situations, and just like the Psalmist found peace, we can find peace by surrendering to God what we control, uh, what what we cannot control, and then choosing to walk by faith and obedience in what we can control. And that's that's kind of how we're going to end this. So uh, let's let's. Give us some statistics Talk here. about some yeah. things that yeah. people are afraid of. And by the way, if you have not gotten um, your, uh, your participants guide or the papers that go along with this, we want to be able to make those available to you. So make sure you reach out to someone at the office, either by phone or by email, and we'll make sure that um, you get those, whether it's after the fact to review it or ahead of time, wherever you hear this message. Uh, but know that we have those for you. Yep, uh, LCC Taunton at Gmail will we'll, uh, we'll get you to me and I'll send it to you. I'll send you the PDF. Absolutely. So all of us experience fear. Um, there's all sorts of organizations that love to categorize and statisticalize. I just made up a new word. Oh, I like it. Um, <laughs> all sorts of things. And they asked, Gallup asked people, um, Americans, just kind of what they were most afraid of. And if... I said that to you, just stop for a moment and think, if I said, what are you most afraid of? Um, you know, take a second and think about what that would be. And there's all sorts of common fears and then maybe some irrational ones. Um, we, we have one that's not irrational. We share it, you, you and I share a phobia, running out of coffee. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Caffeinophobia. I made up two words tonight. Moving on. Uh, so there are 37% of people fear heights. That's not an unusual one. 34% uh, fear being closed in small spaces. Also fairly common. 27% fear spiders and insects. I, I, I might add snakes to that if I were going to go out on a limb there. You missed that one. 51%. Oh, I'm sorry. I did miss that one. Apparently, it had its own category of 51%. Oh, this was my favorite part. I actually missed a whole part here because the second one, which I always find odd, says number two is public speaking. 40% of the general population is afraid of public speaking. In, in fact, they said that there were more people afraid of public speaking than dying. I, I guess I I guess I get that I don't know most of the time I, I 
There's an awful lot of things I'd, I'd rather I, not I, I do. I don't know about that. No, but I, I that is, you get into conversation with people and, and it is um, amazing. So spiders, insects, 21% uh, of people fear needles and getting shots. And I, I do remember being in college and I ran the, the, in the, the college um, blood drives for a few semesters and it always amazed me the great big jocks and the big burly guys who are completely terrified to give blood and I would try to shame them every semester and it just never worked. 20% um, fear mice, 18% fear flying on airplanes and your biggest fear may not have even been mentioned there um, but certainly those are some of the big ones. But fears, I think one of the things that I, it was meaningful to me about this paragraph, it said, fears often can't even be named until we face them. Like you might not know that you're afraid of something un until you face it. Like you think about David and Goliath and he, he might not have known he was afraid or not afraid of nine feet tall uh, giants until he faced one. I also think that that fears can come upon you later. Things that you hadn't been afraid of before, that sometimes with age or bad experiences or, or something happening in your life, that you can develop fears later on that you didn't have earlier. And I think sometimes too that causes us to beat up on ourselves a little bit more. Um, so just really be thinking um, about those fears that whether they're rational or irrational, we all struggle with it, and I love the fact that the, the Bible so clearly talks about these things, reminding us that God hasn't left us to our own devices and that he does care about these fears we have. I, I, you know, I think that that is a, a really uh, important thing that you just said, is that we can, we can get into, we can develop a fear uh, because of a bad circumstances. I, I remember when I was so sick, uh, you know, I've never, I've never cared about heights. In fact, I actually enjoy being in, on heights. But um, when I was so sick, I went up. I was at Glad Tidings. Remember, remember the archways that you, you used to have the big like wagon wheel. Yeah. And well, I was putting the the dimmer packs for the stage lights up there. The old fashioned when you when you had dimmer packs and they were actually the hot lights that got really hot mm -hmm. and everything like that. So I was running the wiring up there. And and I'm up about 14 feet, which is not that's that's nothing to me. I, I don't mind. I mean, I I was up on a 200 foot water tower and putting it and installing an antenna and I was fine. Mm -hmm. um, no, because the, the, the ladder I was on was very, it was welded to yeah. the, it, you know, it was solid. So don't look down. I mean, you get nauseous when you look down, but, but I'm up 14 feet and I was weak at the, in those mm. days because I was so sick and I got up to the top and I, I realized, wow, I'd better get down. I don't have this strength. I'm, I'm sitting up here and I'm not sure I have the strength to get from this ledge that I'm on to the ladder, but I'd better get on uh, there. And from that point on, until I got my strength back, I was really afraid of mm. heights because I was afraid of my ability to deal with it. Um, there and this brings me to the sciency part of this, and and so she threw the sciency part. <laughs> it's a, to more than right any person. other ex emotion we experience, fear is linked to our brain and our nervous system. That you may have fears that are not you're not, you just can't in a moment talk yourself out of. And, and let me show you the science behind that. When we walk into a potentially dangerous situation, our nervous system immediately kicks in a fear response. You don't, it's not necessarily, oh, I've decided to be afraid. This happens. This response consists of a number of involuntary reactions that occur in our body. Our brain diverts blood away from our digestive system to our muscles in case we have to run or fight. Our eyes dilate, making our peripheral vision better. Our body releases adrenaline, which is intensifies our awareness and gives us extra energy in case we have to run. And so you have no conscious decision over that. Right. Neurobiologists have identified two separate neurological pathways for those fear responses in our brain. And the first is what they call a short pathway. It runs from the thalamus in our brain directly to the amygdala. The amygdala is an almond-shaped mass located in the temporal lobe of 
of our brain and this short pathway is immediate response it's quick but it's often wrong because it's too quick um, for instance, we've all startled the cat, uh, you know, we've startled the cat, the cat jumps up, you know, uh, right. and, and it's, a, it's a startled response, um, but it's, the cat could jump, the cat is just jumping, the cat is not directing its jump anywhere, right. it's too, it's startled. The second neural pathway is a longer one. It goes from the thalamus to the cortex and then to the amygdala. And the longer pathway takes a split second longer because it passes through your cerebral cortex. That's your brain. So, that, so your brain can evaluate the threat to determine whether it's really dangerous or not. And if the threat really isn't dangerous, the cortex stops, uh, steps in and stops the fear response. So neurobiologists uh, think people who struggle with phobias have some sort of malfunction in this longer pathway only to have the functioning short pathway. So it, it, get this. Okay, let, let, me, let me give me an illustration. Some of you like, and that I would be one, I like roller coasters, okay? Because... He is alone in that environment. <laughs> because it's fun. You've got the you've got the contrast of this this rush of you know, I'm falling, I'm going down, I'm going being thrown in, uh, to the side and twisted around, but you're really okay. And and there's the contrast because you're you're for me, I'm going through the longer pathway and my brain is saying, but you're going to live. This is fun. <laughs> this, this is glorious. And so because I... Because you're going to live, it's fun. Because you're going to live. <laughs> if I didn't know I was going to live, it would be terrifying. You know, when you're you're in a car and, and you're going toward, your, you've got the brakes locked on and you're not going nearly as fast as you are on that roller coaster, but you don't know if you're going to live. That's terrifying. But on the roller coaster, it's fun because I've got but some folks don't have that ability on some of their fears to go the longer pathway. They can't talk their way out of it. And that's what we kind of want to talk to you about today. That's right. So there's a story of a woman in Arkansas is a true example of how these pathways <laughs> I work. Love that. I love this story. You have to kind of visualize this as it goes because she's fine. Uh, a woman in Arkansas was sitting in her car after shopping when she heard a loud bang and felt a sharp pain in the back of her head. She's picturing this. So she was holding her hands behind her head. A passerby asked if she was okay. And she says, I've been shot in the head. I'm holding in my brains. <laughs> she responded from that short pathway that bypassed the brain and just connected those things, bypassed the cortex, and the truth was that the heat had caused a biscuit canister to explode in the back seat, creating a loud explosion as it shot biscuit dough into the back of her head. Not even the biscuit can, just the biscuit dough. And so what she's holding is basically, I love this expression, a busted can of biscuits, and thinking it's her brains falling out. And only after the cortex kicked in could she evaluate the false alarm and realize, oh, that was my dinner rolls <laughs> and not her brains falling out. What we experience as fear is a series of involuntary responses that occur in our bodies, which doesn't mean it doesn't feel real. And it doesn't mean those emotions are, are figments of your imagination, but it does mean that many of them are not actual real. Um, in, in verse 4 of the psalm, uh, he, he, David is saying, My heart pounds in my chest. The terror of death assaults me. Fear and trembling overwhelm me. I can't stop shaking. Um, what are you most afraid of and why? What experience? Uh, David has experienced a fair level of, of conflict in his life. Oh, and, yeah. And he's experienced, he's experienced physical combat. And their physical combat was not like ours. Well, I even mean, before the physical combat, yeah. he was hanging out there in the pasture with nothing but his little slingshot with, with the bears and lions. 
tigers oh my yes <laughs> yes that was very real fear that, yeah that's not a roller coaster fear <laughs> I, I i heard somebody say you know that which does not kill you makes you stronger except for bears bears will kill you yes <laughs> yeah. absolutely but he, but he he learned to trust god well now we know from many things that he said in the psalms that he learned to trust to god and when we and we hear him say this to saul when he when he's facing Goliath that he learned to trust God in fearful situations because of ex his experiences but now he's in a place where he's not facing a bear or a lion he's not facing a giant but man this is making him afraid and have you ever had a fear that you you've gotten over mm. and if you got over it how did you get over it do you think most of your fears are valid or imagined and there's there's a uh, when you're going through a period of fear and anxiety uh, right now, everybody is experiencing some level of anxiety. You'd be if you're not experiencing some level of anxiety, you're probably not paying attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and yet when we go through is there a word from the Lord well yes there is and we're glad you asked us that question let's come back to the psalm that's right and I, I just think when I look at that thinking about whether your fears are valid or imagined this is not my area of education or expertise but just from living long enough I I think that if you don't if you don't validate that you have those fears, if you spend all your time beating yourself up for having them instead of looking at them and bringing them to the Lord and asking Him to help you sort them out, they're probably not going to go anywhere. Like this is, there's nowhere in here that I, I feel like we're hearing God beating us up for mm -hmm. having them. Um, but He also doesn't want to want to leave us in terror and fright and and phobias. And I think that that's I just listening to the rest of the Bible study. I want you to keep that in your mind that God's not beating you up for this and and that you shouldn't either, but that doesn't mean that we can't move forward. And this is this is great. So those very first five verses in, in Psalms, I love this. It says, when we're afraid, we dwell on the possibilities and we want to run, fight, or distrust others. This is teaching point one on your on your uh, outline there. Yes. And I it I don't know whether your your guide will say this or not, but it says almost every Hebrew word for fear occurs in the first five verses of the psalm. And this is one of those times where I wish I had Hebrew training mm -hmm. uh, because I would love to see this. I, I think there's so much richness that we miss by not being able to easily access things like that, which is the great part of a Bible study. It says the first form of fear mentioned is troubling thoughts because we obsess about the what ifs. And you either just said ouch or you pointed at someone or you pointed at yourself when you said ouch. Um, but troubling thoughts when we're afraid. Dwelling on the possibilities of what might happen often produces an oppressive rest restlessness. Take a minute. Do you think, even if you have to pause this, take a minute and think about your own fears. Are they what ifs or are they actual fears? And, and I do think right now what this world is experiencing with the COVID um, has probably produced a lot of both of those things. But I, I have a dear friend who has a young adult child who has wrapped himself up in, in the what ifs of a, of a healthy young man who shouldn't have the worries that it doesn't want his parents to leave the house because he's afraid they're going to die and doesn't want to and has just paralyzed himself and it's heartbreaking to watch and that is a what that is a what if so think about that and then what was David afraid of according to verse 3 was he suffering from the what ifs or what was doing this to him and if you look at that verse 3 again it says my enemies shout at me, making loud noises and threats. They bring trouble on me and angrily hunt me down. That was probably not a what if. If there was anyone who was truly allowed his own paranoia sometimes, I think that was David. Because he really was being hunted by the most powerful man in the country for a good long time. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean there's nothing yeah, to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're afraid we also want to run. 
And it says, oh, that I had wings like a dove. Have you ever felt like this? That I would fly away and rest. I would fly away. far away to the quiet of the wilderness. Neurobiologists have identified this idea as a fight or flight reaction in our brains that prepares us to either run away or to defend ourselves. And David himself, David who battled bears and lions and nine feet tall giants, wanted to run away, wanted to fly away like a bird. And God is not getting on to him about this. Think about a time that you wanted to flee because of your fear. What happened? And it doesn't have to be mortal danger. It could be an, an oppressive situation, a social situation, a family situation, a, a problem in your life that you just didn't know how to deal with. And then finally, there's a verse, um, and we didn't read this, but if you go down in chapter 55 to verse 15, it says, let death stalk my enemies. Let the grave swallow them alive, for evil makes its home within them. There is nothing warm and squishy about that <laughs> verse. Jesus loves me, this I know, does not pop itself up in this verse. And <laughs> scholars call this an imprecatory prayer. A prayer that calls down a curse or death on one's enemies. I hope you're not praying things like this. Imprecatory prayers in the Psalms are troubling because they seem hateful and unchristian. Well, yeah, but David expresses to God his urge to lash out. When a person is afraid, they become capable of doing things that are totally out of character. I think we've both seen that. We've all seen that. There, there's something that really, at the level of maturity, um, that, that, that I always require in Bible study. And especially with the Psalms, these people are people. Mm. And we live yeah. in this politically correct society where you're supposed to say everything correct and you're never supposed to make a mistake unless you're, unless you're one of those people that can say everything incorrect and get away with it. And we have some of those too. Uh, there's some actors, some politicians, yeah. some, some uh, sports figures, and they, can, they go around and they make a habit of saying everything. Uh, and somehow people forgive them. But, but for most of us, it's like we live in this area. You've got to get around some people where you can occasionally have those, be honest about those feelings that are less than worthy and have a corrective where, you, where somebody sees you, where you are and they say snapshot and they realize it's a snapshot of where you are and what you feel like, but that's not who you are all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. And you can, I, I've said this to kids for years, it's like, you can be honest with God. God can mm -hmm. take it. Mm -hmm. God can take it. And you, if you cannot be honest with God, then there is, there is not a whole lot of, <laughs> that means you're kidding yourself, you're kidding God. Because you know, we've talked about this, He can read your mind anyway, He can read your heart anyway. Really, in the end, the only person you're not being honest with is yourself. Mm -hmm. And so when we're afraid, it, be honest with God, um, and, but sin not. I know that's kind of morphing a few verses together, but you're, you're going to say those things to him. And then sometimes you really do just need to release the internal pressure in your brain and in your heart. And then David's fears were almost paranoia. He mm -hmm. pictured the entire city plotting against him. Now, occasionally it happened in his life. So it's not that he was always just wrong. Just because you're paranoid <laughs> doesn't mean they're not out to get you. <laughs> but these feelings stem from betrayal by a close companion. <laughs> And when we're afraid, we do we can grow distru distrustful. Sometimes it's right. Sometimes we should be distrustful. Sometimes it's irrationally. And then, and whether that's wide groups of people or just within a small group, is you have to think about what causes us to distrust and know that 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 that's just adding another layer on top of it. So, which of the following do you most fear? Uncertainty about life. Betrayal by others, a physical circumstance, like some of those things we talked about, heights or crowds or snakes. Um, strangers, financial insecurity, illness, others. Think about those things for a minute. And that, that was a big list and that was just a really quick one. 
In teaching point two, it says we find peace when we surrender what we can't control mm. to God. Absolutely. And th that's, that's a, a great lesson. I just have to repeat that. We find peace when we surrender what we can't control to God. I am a big um, fan of doing something and, and you know, for me, I, I think there's a level of honesty that you have to have and maturity that you have to have when you come to a real Bible study that you can see David, we, you know, praying those prayers that are pretty harsh uh, and against his enemies. Yeah. And, and is that his finest moment? No. Is it an honest moment? Yes. So what do you want to be? You want to be fi at your finest or you want to be honest? You know what? I don't think you can be at your finest if you're not honest somewhere at some time. And the best place to do that is with God. But you're not going to find that peace. We have those times when we're just not at peace and we know we can't control the situation. The, 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 the people really are out to get us or the situation really is dire. And we're looking at the future and we go, how in the world is there possibly going to be enough money for me this month or, or in the future or for retirement or whatever you, you're, you're, you're fretting about that. There is, I'm a big fan of doing something uh, mm -hmm. because I find that, um, that th these things, they beat you up in the middle of the night when you're supposed to be sleeping and you go and you're there, well, if I fall asleep right now, I'll get six hours. Of sleep. And if I fall asleep right now, I'll get four hours. Yeah. So that's a whole sleep cycle. And if I fall asleep right now, I'll at least get to, you know, you know, you know, you have those nights. And you know what? I've learned to short circuit that, that whole anxiety thing at night. I get up. If there's something really bothering me, I get up, I write it down on a list. What's bothering me? And I, I write, okay, God, this is the deal. Here's what I can do about this. And I write down what I can mm. do. And this stuff I can't do anything about, that's yours. And, and really, that's my way of, of tangibly doing what this t teaching point is all about. Be and that, then, oh, honestly, I can go back to sleep at that point. Because I have handed, I'm like, all right, I'm going to get work to work on this. I know that I'll do that. But God, this other stuff... You're just going to have to handle it, and I'm going to have to trust you with it. And at that point, I will. Um, David, look, look at verses 16 and 17, will you, in Psalm 55. But I will call on God, and the Lord will rescue me. Mm -hmm. Morning, noon, yeah. and night, I cry out in my distress, and the Lord hears my voice. Morning, noon, and night. So, uh, yeah, he, he had some of those late nights. David tries to connect with God by calling aloud, and we all often forget to ask God for help. Instead, we turn to friends who will validate our fears or people who will kind of put a Band-Aid on it, but they can't really do anything about the situation that we can't control. They can sympathize, and I'm not negating the fact that that can help, you know, yeah. talking things out, but God doesn't always deliver us from our fears. Sometimes he delivers us through them. As sometimes he, we may pray that he take our cancer away or deliver us from bankruptcy or protect us from harm during war, but he doesn't always do that. So how can we, how can crying out to him all day help us with our fears? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question. Let's go to verse 19 now. Skip down a couple verses to verse 19. God, who has ruled forever, will hear me and humble them. For my enemies refuse to change their ways. They do not fear God. As for my companion, he betrayed his friends. He broke his promises. His words are, are as smooth as butter, but in his heart is war. His words are as soothing as lotion, but underneath are daggers. Give your burdens to the Lord, and he will take care of you. When he, we, uh, in history, we're not exactly sure. It, repeatedly in this psalm, David rep, uh, refers to somebody who betrayed him. We're not sure whether it's his son Absalom or whether it's his friend that went to Absalom's uh, side. His friend's name was Ahithophel. He writes an, an entire psalm about Ahithophel. But, um, but we're not sure, but he's been, been betrayed. Verse 22 is the key. Give your burdens to the Lord. He will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. But you, O oh God, will send the wicked down to the pit of destruction. Murderers and liars will die young, but I am trusting you to save me. That's the whole thing. God, you have to trust 
that God has a plan and that he will has a plan for your life and that he will save you. That's right. So we all have that circle of concern in our lives. Your circle of concern represents the people and the situations that you're concerned about today. And then it might be your finances, your health, that whole list that we just talked about. Um, physical fears or interpersonal fears, whatever it is. And all of us have certain situations and people that we're concerned about. They're going to cause us to worry and they're always going to be there. And then inside that circle of concern is this smaller circle. And Stephen Covey calls it a circle of influence. And it's things that we have some control over. Um, whether it's, you know, if you're a student and you have a big test coming up, you have some control over that. You can really study for that. Um, you have, you know, if you're one of those 40% of people who are terrified of public speaking, but you have a public speech to give, you practice it a bunch in front of people or in front of the mirror or in front of something. There are some things that you can do something about. And then the things that are outside of our control are outside of that circle of influence. And, and the ones that are inside that circle, once they're done, they're done. It's like they're, they're off your plate. But verse 22 encourages us to focus our energies on the situations we actually have control over. And that verse says, I don't know why this keeps sticking. I'm so sorry. Here we go. Give your burdens to the Lord. It doesn't get any clearer than that. Mm -hmm. Listen to that again. Give your burdens to the Lord and he will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. He will take care of you. I hear an old song starting in the back of my, of my ears right now that he will take care of you. Yeah, yeah. And, and so those things that you have some control over, do what you can for them. And the ones that you can't, God, God wants to take care of for you. He's not looking to beat you up. My home pastor used to put it this way. God expects us to do the natural. Let him take care of the that's supernatural. Right. And, and that, that's a, a good thought for you today. We're going to end right there. And I'm going to ask Pastor Beth to pray, pray a prayer of blessing over you as, as we all have things that are concern us at this time that you'll find that peace that David found. Absolutely. God, I thank you that you care about us, that you want to take your burdens. You want to take our burdens away from us and make them yours and just that you care about us. I love that your word is so clear right there. And God, I pray for those who are hearing my voice, Lord, who have heard maybe one of their own fears come up tonight, or we haven't mentioned it, and maybe they're even feeling more guilty or more fearful or more overwhelmed because something wasn't mentioned that they struggle with. And God, I just pray for your um, gentleness for us, that you be gentle with those who are really struggling with this, whether it is valid or whether it it might fall into the category of, of not really so valid, but still gripping. You want us to be free. You have plans for us. You have good plans that aren't for our detriment to give us hope in a future. And, and we can't move forward in that future if we're wrapped up in fear. Mm -hmm. And so I thank you that you said in your word that perfect, um, that, that your perfect love will cast out our anxiety and our fear. And so we just pray that now, Lord. We, we stand on your word. We take you at your word that you will do what you say you will do, Lord, and that that will overcome the fear in our lives, God. And I thank you for being such a good, good father to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll see you next week, folks. And we've got another one for you next week. Excited. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.